Hey everyone, it's Colin, how's it going? The last time we saw this Apple IIe, I had pulled it out of an e-waste pile, gotten it cleaned up, replaced the capacitor and the power supply that was about to explode, fixed the monitor's chopped off power cable, and hooked up a cool modern floppy drive alternative. But the machine still didn't work quite right, and I tracked the problem down to a bad RAM chip. And that's where we're at now. My replacement parts have arrived, so let's get this thing working for real. To get access to the failed RAM chip, I needed to remove the motherboard from the computer. I started by pulling out the expansion cards. The disk controller was first, then I disconnected the rear port cable from the serial card and took it out next. Finally, the third-party parallel port card was removed, and then I could disconnect the cable from the power supply. Tucked under the right side of the machine is the ribbon cable for the keyboard, and towards the front is the two-pin connector for the speaker. There are four Phillips head screws that hold in the back edge of the motherboard, and I got them taken out. The rest of the board is secured with these plastic posts. I used a spudger to push in the little tab, then I could pull the board up and move on to the next one. Eventually, I got the motherboard free and carefully maneuvered it out of the case. This board is in excellent cosmetic shape. Other than a little dust, there's no corrosion and no signs that it's ever been repaired or reworked. From what I can tell by the system's built-in diagnostics, the RAM chip at position 12 here is the culprit. The RAM in this 2E is made up of Micron 4264 chips, which are 8 kilobytes each, for a total of 64K in the system. I flipped the board over and desoldered the chip with the help of some thin braid. I could have used a desoldering pump, but I'm not the biggest fan of them. They just haven't been very effective for the projects that I work on. But the braid is easy to work with, and with some practice can give great results. The chip came out without a fuss, and I cleaned up the flux residue with an alcohol wipe. Now I had a decision to make. To keep the board looking original, I could solder the replacement chip directly back into the board. The downside to that is if that chip didn't work, it wouldn't be so easy to swap it out. Alternatively, I could install a socket on the board, which would allow me to just pop in a new chip. Yeah, it would be kind of obvious when looking at the board that a chip had been replaced, but it would at least be a period accurate repair. And besides, almost all of the other chips came in sockets from the factory, including the CPU. So going with the socket made the most sense to me. I bought a pack of 10 for just a few bucks and I made sure they were the so-called dual wipe kind, which make better connections with the chip's legs. It took just a minute to solder the socket to the board, then I cleaned up the flux again. Okay, now for another decision. Which RAM chip to use? I had bought some replacement Micron chips from a seller in China. They were listed as being new, but who knows if that's actually true. What I was concerned about is if they were counterfeit. A common tactic that unscrupulous part sellers have is to relabel other, cheaper chips. To check for this, I scrubbed the top of one of them with an alcohol wipe. If it was fake, the printing on the top would come off but when the alcohol dried, it was clear the marking had stayed. So that's a good sign that at least these are legit. Now, some people in the retro computing community have a fairly uh, strong opinion on these Micron chips. Basically, they're believed to not be reliable and the recommendation is to avoid them. The problem is that there's no hard data to confirm this, and my gut kinda tells me that attitude may be based in kind of a reverse survivorship bias. There were a lot of these chips made at the time, so it stands to reason that in terms of quantity, more failed chips will be seen. There were a lot of other chip manufacturers in the 80s too, and there was this whole political thing in 1986 where the US accused Japanese manufacturers of selling chips below cost in order to knock American competitors out of the market. And there's a theory that American chips were lower quality as a way to drive down costs, but all oh, that's another story. 
Anyway, I also managed to find a random batch of vintage RAM chips to give me other options. Most of them wouldn't work in this machine, but some of them would, in particular these two models from Panasonic and Mitsubishi. There were a bunch of other chips that were the same type, but had a slower refresh speed. 200 nanoseconds instead of 150 like the other chips in this 2E. You want the speed of all the chips in the system to match. Out of curiosity, I decided to try one of the new Micron chips. I figured if it didn't work, no big deal. I popped one into the socket, then got the machine reassembled. The motherboard just snapped back into place, then I got the screws put back in. I got the cables connected and the cards reinstalled. Then I plugged it in and started it up to the self-test. And, well, that's disappointing. It was the same error as before. Okay, maybe the new chip was bad, so I swapped in another one, and it did the same thing. And so did another. And another. I thought, maybe there is some truth to that whole thing about Micron RAM after all? But then I tried some of the chips from the other batch, and they also failed the self-test. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if some of these were bad, but like seven chips in a row? Something else was wrong. Even though I'd tested it earlier, I checked the voltages on the power supply again, and they all looked good. I also pulled the motherboard out and tested the socket I installed, and it showed continuity to all the places it was supposed to. This was thankfully easy to do since the PCB is only double-sided, with no middle layers like modern boards. I also tried running the self-test without a chip in the socket at all, and got completely different results. It showed garbage characters on screen and wouldn't complete the test. So at least there was some difference with a chip in place, and with all the RAM in the system, it otherwise behaved like it had before. It would kind of boot some programs, and I could use BASIC, but it was glitchy. I found a diagnostic program online and copied it over to my floppy MU. Thankfully, it was able to start and run, and kicking off a test against the RAM, it showed a lot of errors beginning at the upper end of the memory address space. And that really confused me. It was clear there was a bad RAM chip, but the errors continued no matter which one I swapped in. And then it hit me. The self-test indicated that the chip second from the right was bad. And that's the one I swapped second from the right when viewing the board from the front. But I thought, maybe the self-test doesn't show the RAM that way. I did some more searching and ran across a page that lists common Apple II errors. In the section for the 2E self-test, it says that chips on the board are laid out from left to right, like I expected. But the self-test lists the chips from right to left. So the second chip from the right on screen is the second chip from the left on the board. I had replaced the wrong chip. So I removed the second RAM chip from the motherboard, which the silkscreen refers to as part UF7, and got a socket installed in its place. I dropped in another of the new Micron chips I bought, put everything back together, and ran another self-test. Oh, yeah! Just to be sure, I ran the diagnostic disk again, and it didn't come back with any memory errors this time. Programs now loaded just as they should, and with the floppy MU, it was fast. Starting up games like Oregon Trail or going through the intro sequence for Carmen Sandiego sparked a ton of memories from when I was young, playing these in elementary school computer class. Was replacing the wrong chip a silly mistake? Yep. And that's because I've never had to fix one of these before. By the time I started learning how to fix computers, the Apple II line was long dead, and retro computing wasn't really even a thing yet. It also goes to show just how important it is that we document our knowledge about how to fix devices like this. I did a lot of searching when troubleshooting this RAM problem, and even ran across stories from other people who had encountered the same thing, but no one jumped in to explain how the self-test worked. That person probably replaced the wrong chip, too. 
Now, for me, the experience of fixing something is just as rewarding as the end result. So yeah, while it would have been nice to have not wasted the time swapping the wrong chip and making myself look and feel like an idiot, in the end, I did learn a few things. Not just technical information, but also a reminder to maybe not jump to conclusions about how things work, to do some research to confirm them first. Otherwise, despite the time I spent with these in school, other problems that may crop up could again school me. If you liked the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.